my comment here says, uh, or his initial comment is, how do you pay back all these loans? Let me see. Okay, so how are you paying back all these loans you're taking out? Infinite banking was deemed a scam decades ago. Not, not true. Funny people are trying to bring it back. So his genuine question was about a loan repayment strategy, and then he just went into slandering IBC with no reference to any article or anything backing him up. So I wanted to answer his legitimate question, which was how do you pay all the loans back that you're taking out? That is a legitimate question. That's a great question. Actually, I could do a whole video on that. But Nelson in his book, Becoming Your Own Banker, outlines in a couple different places strategies to repay loans. So in part one, he talks about creating your own banking system through the dividend paying life insurance policy, the mechanism of taking loans and the mechanism of paying them back functionally within the contract. So like practically, how do you take a loan and pay that back? What happens when you take a loan? What happens when you pay that back? Nelson hashes out all the mechanics of taking a loan and repaying it in part one, creating your own banking system. Part three, he talks about how to start building your own banking system. And part three goes into the import, the moral importance of paying back loans. And also in the long run, the importance to your banking system of paying back those runs. So he makes them uh, the loans. So he makes the moral case of paying back loans. And then in part four, equipment financing, he gives a concrete, practical example of a guy that owns a logging company taking loans from his policy, buying logging trucks, and then using the cash flows of the company to repay those loans back into his banking system. And then he shows in an illustration, in an actual life insurance illustration, what taking loans and making loan repayments into his own policy, as opposed to taking loans from a bank to purchase those trucks and paying back to the bank, he outlines in the policy what that means in the long run for that guy's bottom line what it means for that guy's retirement. So just in recapturing the lost interest that this logging guy would have paid to a third party bank, just by recapturing that into his own banking system, this guy funds his own retirement. Okay. So if there are any entrepreneurs out there that are wondering, is there a better way to cash flow? Why am I getting raked over the coals by these banks for these interest rates? The majority of my monthly cash flow goes to interest payments instead of premium, instead of uh, capital repayments, right? Instead of principal repayments. How do I fix this? Nelson shows you practically on paper in part four, how a business owner can use the infinite banking concept to finance his business. And then twice in part five, Nelson outlines taking loans and repaying them. He uses an example, much like the logging truck, but this time in an example of the monetary value of a college degree. So he says, what happens if you forego college and instead put your tuition into a life insurance policy? What does the access to capital enable you to do? And Nelson shows an illustration of a young lady who skipped over her PhD program, took that money, put it into an insurance policy and started a rental car business. By the time she's ready to retire, she owns something like 60 rental cars and blah, blah, blah. So Nelson talks about what in, in part five, what is the opportunity cost of having access to your money? So everyone in the comment section here is arguing, basically some people are on board, but most of the people in the comment section are saying that I'm skipping over something that the 401ks are. You can take the match there, but the Roth is where the real magic is. But in both the cases of the 401k and the Roth, you are separating yourself from your access to capital and your ability to go take a loan and then repay it at a higher interest rate. Okay. And so that brings us to the, the fifth one that I thought of, which was part one, the grocery store, the can of peas. So why not charge these folks 62 cents for the can of peas? The extra two cents will go directly to additional capital to buy more cans of peas to sell to other customers. What Nelson's talking about here is charging the average customer 60 cents for a can of peas, but charging yourself and your immediate family, captive customers, 
62 cents for each can of peas, actually overcharging them. And why would you do that? Number one, a captive customer is someone who is going to shop at your grocery store no matter what. They're not going to Walmart. They are a family member. They're going to buy their can of peas from your family grocery store, right? So why charge them more? It's because it contributes to the profitability and the capital stock of the grocery store. Just that extra two cents of peas, two cents on that can of peas in the long run means a lot to the bottom line of the grocery store. And 20, 30, 40 years from now, whenever the owner of the grocery store goes to sell that grocery store, if he's been charging 62 cents on a can of peas instead of 60, his bottom line is going to look way better than the grocery store down the street that's only been charging 60 cents for a can of peas to all the customers over the life of that grocery store. The same analogy can be applied to our infinite banking concept policies. If we can go to a bank and get a 10% interest rate, which is about average right now, but we go to our policy and we can get a 4.5% interest rate, Nelson says to be an honest banker, you need to charge yourself the extra 5.5% interest. You need to charge yourself 10% interest and repay that into your policy so that 30, 40 years from now, your capital stock is much bigger, just like in the grocery store analogy, than someone who charges themselves 4.5% on that policy loan. Now, that extra 5.5% interest paid doesn't actually go to the company. Uh, it does, but it goes to the company in the form of a premium payment, not an interest payment. So that extra margin is actually earmarked as premium that gets paid into your policy. For me, it's a mindset of how far do you go to validate information? And do you like to be, I don't think anybody likes to be blanket statemented, right? If you say things like, oh, those people, blah, blah, blah. Well, what, what people? Mm. You're lumping mm. you with those people. I'm saying the mindset of uh, those people who, uh, uh, who go, oh, hey, the big bad insurance guy's just trying to get commissions off of me. Or you're saying like the, this is better than a 401k. Wait a minute. It might be for your situation and people who are financially like yours, but it may be a terrible idea for these people. So the yeah. point is, folks, like I get we're commenting on YouTube and, and part of that is just, hey, there's no face to it. There's not a whole lot of accountability other than Brad and I might record a video and respond. Who cares? I'm not coming to your place. In a general sense, I, I struggle with the whole mindset of, and I also look at myself at the same time. Okay, where am I screwing that up? Where am I blanketing people? Am I? We all have these built-in biases, right? So I could go off on these tangents, but th th that's how I feel about that in a general sense. It's like, dude, yeah, Brad gets commission. Just like the other 16 million salespeople in the country. And by the way, you bought insurance. Do you have it for your car, your house? You bought, you love buying stuff. You got to, how do I know that guy, gal? Because you're in debt. Why? Because okay. the, the math is there. I know that 50% don't have a 401k. All right, so that's a whole nother thing, right? It's consider the source. When I started in sales back in 04, we used to have the board, right? The, the, the leaders were, right? They were just sales managers, right? I didn't want to be like the guy or gal at the bottom. I wanted to be at the top. So these people down here might give me advice to say, thank you very much. In, in one ear, out the other. Because I don't want to be where that person is. So that's the other challenge with social media, right? It's like, I don't know this Pete, this person making a comment in one sentence. I don't know anything about them. Yeah, what and, right, qualification does this guy to even have, you know? Maybe they're really smart and we should maybe. be interviewing them. You know, maybe they're a moron. I, I just don't know. And it's too hard for me to, and I'm sure you too, but like, to put that task on yourself. Like I, I can't play judge. It's too hard. I just observe. I'm just, yeah. I think my goal is just yeah. to answer the genuine questions. If anyone is just baselessly talking crap, I'm going to ignore that. And I'm going to pick out the genuine question that needs to be answered and ignore everything else. Just like with definitely not Ren. So how are yeah. you paying back all the loans you're taking out? Great question. Definitely not, Ren. 
the real crux of what, I guess there's two major points that all of these people talking about 401ks are missing. I'm going to call it, I'm going to call it three major points, but it's really two. One is theoretical and the other two are practical. So we'll do the practical stuff first because it's not blank to most. Number one, they are missing out or they are ignoring the opportunity cost of the money that they put into their 401k. So one of the key points I make in my video is if you contribute to a 401k, you effectively separate yourself from the use of that money, aside from being invested in a volatile, manipulated stock market, you separate yourself from the use of that money from the minute you put it into the account until you're 59 and a half years old and you can withdraw it without penalty. Okay. Because for those of us who aren't, because you, until you're 59 and a half, you can't, you're penalized unless there's a certain situation where it's maybe a hardship withdrawal type of thing. You go um, into a tra contractual agreement with the federal government saying, hey, I'm not going to touch this money. I'm going to leave this money in this how, account how, to wait, be invested. What do you mean with the federal government? I put my money in through work. Yeah. Except the, Explain the work. Yeah. The work that you contribute through and the financial company that manages your money is simply the custodian of that money. The real agreement that you have in, inside of your 401k is an agreement between you and the federal government. So the federal government created a problem. They created an onerous tax called the income tax. And that income tax went from 1% on the richest uh, people in America back in 1913, all the way to now 22, 24, upwards of 50% in some states on income, right? So the government creates this problem of income tax. And then they also hand you a solution. They say, we know that the federal government is charging you way too much in income tax. Here's a solution. It's called the 401k. The government created the 401k as a solution to people griping about tax brackets. Okay. So Nelson says in the book, if the creator of the solution is also the creator of the problem, should you at least not be a little bit suspicious about the solution? So it's not saying because the government created, throw it out. It's saying because the government created the problem and now they've created the solution, let's ask some questions about the solution. Is this really as good? Is the 401k really as good as the government wants me to think it is? Or is it the lollipop? after I visit the doctor's office and get all these tests run. If Brian, if I walked up to you, let's make it even more personal. If I walked up to Lynn, your wife, and I just karate kicked both of her legs and broke both her legs, how would oh, you feel? Man. How would you feel towards me? How would I feel towards I, you? I don't think you'd exist much longer. Than exactly. Right. A few seconds is hard right. to uh, imagine. Now, what if right after I broke her legs, I handed her a pair of crutches and I was like, ah, oh, see, it's okay, Brian. No need to attack me. I've fixed the problem. Yes, I broke her legs, but now she can walk again with the aid of these crutches that I so graciously handed to her. I'd say that swell. What a guy. Right. Yeah. What right. a nice guy you are. Sure you would. No, I still uh, wouldn't exist. You would still obliterate me. This is what the government is doing to us. They're breaking our legs and then they're handing us the crutches and acting like the white knight in the whole situation. They create an onerous tax burden. They give us a 401k and say, here, save your money pre-tax now so that we can tax it later. Right? The winner in this situation is not the average Joe. And here's why, for these three reasons. The winner in this situation is not the contributor, is not the worker. Because number one, the worker separates himself from the capital. This contract between you and the government, where your employer and your financial institution is the custodian of that account. That agreement separates you from your capital and creates a reliance on third party finance, creates a reliance on bank loans, on going into debt. 
right? Because you, you don't have access to your money to pay for those things, right? And problem number one is the separation from your capital. So they tell you that conventional advice is keep three to six months bills in your savings account in cash and then plump basically everything else you can into your investment portfolio. Get it into your 401k, okay? Right, because so, the tax breaks, that's so, is there math somewhere that shows the tax, you know, can, and we put all this onto a spreadsheet or is there a calculator that says, okay, right now I'm putting X amount into the 401k and this is how it impacts taxes as best as we can estimate. And then so when we stop getting that tax break, now we're taxed on this much more. Okay, so income tax on all the rest goes up and out. There's got to be a way to, and I think that's part of the challenge, even for me, it's like, how do we capture the total value versus this value? Or is it even possible? Yeah, you know, as well as I do, there's a million and one financial models out there that you can go buy. You, you can go buy one of a thousand financial calculators that are going to try their best to calculate what are the tax implications of using this strategy short term and long term? What is the projected growth in this account over the time? Does it make up for the taxes? Blah, 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 right? All, all of those programs are out there that do that. And the one thing, and this is point number two, that those models discount is how much can the, the average person, the average American is losing to third party finance how much they're paying in interest every single month. That is nowhere in those financial calculators, right? Okay, so if I have six months bills cash in my savings account and the rest is in my 401k and I maybe have a little equity in my house, what happens when I need to go buy a new car? What do most people do? Most people, the majority, vast majority of Americans do not withdraw cash out of their savings account, their emergency fund, to go pay full price for a car, right? And even if they did pay cash for a car, conventional financial advice is correct in saying, hey, you probably shouldn't pay cash for that car because if you pay $20,000 cash for that car, number one, that's a depreciating asset. But number two, what else could that $20,000 have been doing? Right. If we put the twenty thousand dollars in the market and it's earning you eight percent, but we finance the car at four percent, then we're four percent net, right? We're four percent net positive. But what they're doing is they're comparing rates and not the volume of interest. You can't just compare the rates. You have to compare the actual volume. This here is C. It's, a, it's an underlying, overarching theme, however you want to call it. It's just people not, for many reasons, you either don't have the time, you don't have the desire, you want to confirm your own beliefs and not, you're just, maybe you're subconsciously, you don't want to challenge your own way of thinking because it sucks to admit, wait a minute, you mean my whole life if I've been thinking wrong, maybe? Telling everybody how right I am, who knows, right? So you said it earlier, ask the questions. It was just buried in a sentence, but that's a main point to me is that we're not asking enough questions, myself included. I was on an appointment the other day and the lady, we're, we're do, getting ready to do the paperwork and which is the final step of the process or onboarding, right? It's like, she goes, wait, why am I doing this again? I'm like, wait a second, let me go to the fact finder. And I realized I didn't have a strong fact finder. Not necessarily because I didn't ask the questions, but I didn't capture them. I didn't write it down. I didn't see if there was additional questions. Like, did I get to the center of the Tootsie Roll Tootsie Pop? Mm -hmm. We're not doing that as a society. The connection that you just pointed out between the eight and the four percent, I think people look at things in a silo. Okay, here's my credit card debt. I have X amount of debt. I make X amount of money. And the TV sells you things on a monthly basis, right? The car, hey, just the payments, payment. Are you thinking about $307 a month times 12 times seven years? Like 84 months, What? what's that number? Mm -hmm. And so you're saying, 
they're missing the, the finance piece and someone's happy to have you. And isn't that, by the way, what we call modern day slavery? You would want to come out of here and shake the hornet's nest. That's it. And this has been said by other smarter people than me. So it's, that's modern day slavery besides the point. That's what I want to do with our talks is like, hey, let's extrapolate and pull back the onion. And people are just yelling or mad about something else and using the commissions as an excuse. Okay, fine. They'll disappear. But the ones that are like, whoa, let's educate them. So anyway, so, good stuff. Yeah. So let's look at what you're saying, the, the 8% versus the 4%. So let's think about $45,000. Okay. Let's, How do we get this on the whiteboard, dude? Hold on, hold on. This is good stuff. I got my iPad. I'm trying to like, what in can, my mind, I, I can envision. Screen share, I can screen share this calculator I'm using right now and we can yeah. walk through. This is a standard amortization calculator. This is how loans are calculated, right? Whenever someone says this is a $45,000 car and I can get you a 9% rate, you do not multiply 45,000 times 9% to see how much interest you're going to make, right? Or how much interest you're going to pay. So let's do 45,000. Let me just pull up. A, am I sharing my whole screen? Uh, yeah, I can see your tabs and everything at the top. Okay. Okay. So let's see if you can see this calculator. I see the still the same 45,000 calculate on that tab let, that you had open. Let me reshare. Let me reshare my whole screen. Okay. Now you can see the calculator? Okay. Yes, now I can. Okay. So the 9% interest rate on the six-year $45,000 car loan is misleading, right? Because what most people will think in their brain, what 9% makes you think is I'm going to pay 45000 Where's my calculator so everyone can see? I'm going to pay 45000 times 9%, which would be 1.09. Okay, that'd be a, a $50 interest payment, right? I'm going to pay $50 um, every month for, what's the math on that? 72 months. Okay, so $50 times 72 equals, so if I pay $50 a month in interest, times 72 months, that's $3,600 in interest. This is mathematically incorrect when thinking about interest rates because interest rates are amortized. The interest is calculated on the full principal stretched out over six years. So here's what the amortization actually looks like in an amortization calculator. $45,000 loan, six year loan, 9%. Whereas our simple incorrect math would lead us to think that we're paying $3,600 in interest. In actuality, over the life of this loan, we're going to pay $13,400 in interest. Good Lord. Whoa. So hold on. Whoa. Back in. Huh. Wow. 9% is not a true 9%. So whenever the investor is he's starting down the right path. Whenever your financial advisor says, don't pay cash for that car because we could out earn that in the market, right? He's starting down the right path, but then he loses it shortly thereafter because he is not thinking about volume of interest that he would have to earn in the market. Let's look at the interest paid in the first year of that contract. So $45,000 goes into the in the loan amount, 9% interest, you're paying $3,809.58 in interest. Okay. So let's go back to our calculator and let's take $3,809 and divide that by 45,000. You would have to, the portfolio would have to earn 8.4%, right? That's 8.46% in that year, just to break even with the amount of interest that you're paying on the car. So whereas he said, 
don't pay, you know, if we have a 4% loan rate, I can get you eight in the market and we're coming out four net. You're not coming out net at all. You're barely a wash at 8.5%. So how does the average person figure all this out? I guess they, they, in other words, it doesn't seem to be a complete calculator or you can plug in everything. Like you have to figure taxes somewhere over here. You have to figure some part over here and it's like, you can get close, but it's, I guess that's why you work with a professional and, yeah. you know. Well, the, Nelson would say that there's three actors in every play. Number one, we find it. Let me start here. We finance everything we purchase, whether we pay cash, whether we do that through a third party, whatever. We finance everything we purchase. Okay. The profession that has harnessed the power of finance the best in the history of the world are the bankers, right? The bankers that loan and control the cash flows of money. They are the richest people in the history of the world. I mean, we go back to the Medici's during, during the Renaissance. We go back to the Rockefellers during the late 1800s, early 1900s. We go nowadays to Bank of America, JP Morgan, the Federal Reserve. All of the major banking interests are the wealthiest people in the world, save for Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, right? And to make sure I understand, Bezos, there might be more than one reason why. I guess I'm thinking about the uh, fractional banking. Yeah. Yeah. See, is that, that what that's you're why the bankers that's why the bankers are so rich yeah bezos yeah. and yeah bezos and musk just figured out how to deliver value and a service to a huge group of people that's in high demand so and they did it honestly these bankers are doing it dishonestly and that isn't true for all time there have been gold standards where bankers have been handcuffed from inflation from inflating the money supply but for the most of world history there have been inflationary environments ancient it goes all the way back to ancient rome collapsed because their gold coins had been so diluted they were less gold and more junk metals the richest people in all the world have been the bankers controlling the cash flows of money so nelson argues in the book i think successfully that if the average american would just understand how the flow of money, how that banking function works and control that within their own lives, they would build wealth exponentially faster than someone who does not control the wealth, who control the cash flow in their life. And the best asset in which to bank to control flat cash flows is a dividend paying whole life insurance policy with a non-direct recognition company. So what about the big bank commissions though? I'm That's just thinking dumb. of the perceptions, right? So, okay. So let's the let's questions that stick out in my yeah. So here's what here's where I'm at as a potential consumer. I'm like, okay, the whole thing I already mentioned, four hundred one k. Like, if I take, let's just say it's a thousand a month, whatever. You take that thousand, put it in a whole life Ooh, taxes and net income, and what happens at tax time, right? I can't think of a good enough analogy right off the top of my head that would be like watertight. So I guess I'll just talk through it. I wonder if this guy knows that his Roth 401k is charging him a commission also. In what way? In what way? The management fund that's built into the, the charge on the Roth. Okay. Take me deeper. What match? Okay. Every Roth 401k is going to have a custodian. Maybe it's TD Ameritrade. Maybe it's Vanguard. Um, who, whoever that is. Maybe it's Chase Bank. Whoever is the custodian of your Roth 401k charges percentage commission. And they charge that percentage commission every single year, whether your account balance is up or whether your account balance is down. Some percentages are 1%. Some percentages are 3%. It depends on the company that you have your Roth 401k with, right? So wouldn't, okay. So are you talking about the, plan, the 401k or retirement plan administration itself, or 
are you saying that plus the fun costs that may exist inside that retirement plan? I wasn't talking about the fun costs, but that's another point. Yeah. There are costs to the funds that you're invested in. I'm just talking about the management fees, the overarching institutional management fees. Aren't they really low though, Brad? How low is low? Yeah. I, low. It's been years since I played in the retirement plan world at all. I don't have a lot of experience with it, but, but back then I'm talking 20, I don't know, 18, 19, whatever. It was, it was race to the bottom. It was companies trying to see how low they could get their fees in a lot of cases now, or you had well-established firms that were just, here's our fee and here's how we justify it. And it's well worth paying them, but for small mom and pops, it's, okay, I can get basically free ETFs now for fun costs and I could probably get some software that could pretty much help me stay compliant. The costs don't seem to be that much. You, you can do that. Sure. You could drive your costs down low by self-managing. I don't know a lot of Americans that have the specific knowledge in a specific industry to self-manage a portfolio. Now, Dave Ramsey would argue that you can just go buy blue chip mutual dividend paying stocks and let them ride for the rest of your life. But again, we come to the problem of separating yourself from your capital. Now you're reliant on third-party finance. So if you go finance a vehicle, right? And it's costing you $3,800 a month or whatever that number was we came up with. Then your portfolio is going to have to return 8% year after year just to pay the, just to break even on the interest. So your separation of capital in the 401k causes expenses at other places, right? So yes, you can drive the management fees down as low as possible through self-management, mm -hmm. through using free apps, but the separation from capital creates major expenses in other areas. So that's the main thing is that I can't use my money and you somebody else is the and the somebody, well, okay. So you, you can't talk, use your own money. So you pay someone else to use their money, even though you have money, right? But that's, oh, uh, that's, so you pay someone to use their money, even though you have money that you could be using instead of their money. Okay, dude, like, so why I keep going back to the tax piece is because I'm going, all right, commission or no commission is making sense to me. I just want to see how the taxes can, can you answer that? Let's say I'm sitting with you or on an appointment and I'm about to sign up, but that's, I need to see, you. okay. How do you go about that for a client? Like, how do you answer that? I'm a bottom line thinker. I'm a bottom line guy. And so that's how I'm evaluating this is going, okay, I could right now, assuming we're healthy enough to qualify or whatever, do this and get a life policy and okay, fund it. But that means if I take all the 401k that, what would you recommend? First of all, would you leave the match amount at least in the 401k? Or are you saying that even the company match, which is a hundred percent return essentially, right? You're saying that even that mathematically is not going to be as good as doing this. Okay. Assuming that's the case, yeah, I want to see what's the, at the end of the year, which is the better overall situation for me, all things considered. I'll, I'll tell you right now, John, if you have a mortgage, if you have especially a newer mortgage within the first 10 years, 10 to 15 years, if you have a mortgage, if you have a car payment, if you have a boat payment, if you have a uh, student debt. If you have uh, kids' braces on a credit card, right? If you have any third-party financed debt as an American, you are probably losing 34 and a half cents of every dollar to interest payments and possibly more with the new higher interest rates. And that's what I showed on the calculator earlier, the amortization calculator was, yeah. Yeah. yes, we made... Let me see what our monthly payments are in this situation. All right. While you're doing that, so I'm c consistently summarizing. So basically anybody, we know most people have loans. We know most people. Okay. So you basically have to be healthy enough to qualify for coverage. You or a spouse, right? 
that's one requirement. You have to, you don't have to, but in an ideal world, you're contributing either to a 401k and you could reposition that money, right? You have loans. Does that make you a perfect candidate or an ideal candidate to investigate this or what else am I missing, if anything? What makes me a good candidate or not? What else am I? I think nearly everyone is a good candidate as long as they are making more money than they spend. Nelson, <laughs> Nelson in his book calls, calls it Parkinson's law. You cannot let what was once the luxury become a necessity. What's the name of that law? How would you spell it? Parkinson's, no. Parkinson's, P-A-R-K-I-N-S-O-N-S, like Parkinson's oh. disease, but it's not, it's a different guy. It's Parkinson's law. Okay. Yeah, unfortunately. My Parkinson's, had that. yeah. Parkinson's law is, it's, uh, it's just a truth, a human truth that this guy pointed out that most people have trouble um, whenever their income increases, not letting their lifestyles expand to meet that income. Yep. And there, he, yeah, me too. And he said it very <laughs> eloquently. He said, a luxury once enjoyed soon becomes a necessity. Yeah. Yep. Right. That's how I look at air conditioning. I a lot of, yeah. That's yeah. how my wife looks at air conditioning too. And I, I, I don't see eye to eye on that one. So. So, um, if, great stuff. so who's the primary candidate? If you have conquered Parkinson's law and you have positive cash flow, that if you make more money than you spend, then you have to put your money somewhere. And the case that I'm made, making, the case that Nelson makes, is the smartest place to put your money first is a dividend paying whole life insurance policy. Okay, and let me get it straight. You don't make any money at all whatsoever unless somebody chooses to make you their advisor, right? Or make you their insurance person, right? Correct, yep. So you're here talking about this stuff, educating people. You go and meet with them. You get to seminars, whatever. You put in a lot of time. And now there's all kinds of rules that it's harder to contact people for a good reason. There's... People have bugged the daylights out of folks. Okay, fine. But you're doing all that and making nothing. And if I decide to work with you, you'll make some money. Usually you don't get it all up front. Sometimes you do in certain policies. Like Medicare, for example, I, I get paid a piece each month when the person makes their payment every month and it's spread out over six years. Why? Why are they spread out over six years? Well, because... The company wants the person to be taken care of because they like it, that recurring in income stream. And guess what? So does the agent. Makes right? so it's a way that I can. They're incentivizing the long term relationship between you and the client. That's right. So it's either the company is going to pay the 1 800 number call center people, God bless them, but they're working by the hour. And if five o'clock comes, you have an issue, they're out mm -hmm. and they don't know your whole story and so forth. So the company says, hey, Let's pay these people. Let's incentivize them to align their interests with the customer interest as best we can. Now, granted, you can argue that all, hey, there's any life insurance policies. You're going to pick the one with it. Oh my gosh, guy. Yeah, if you're brand new and you need every eight cents, maybe that's your, okay, you've been doing this 20, 30 years, whatever. You got some income yourself. Okay, yeah, I want sales and money, but dude, come on, let's drop the sales. Okay. But it's built this way on purpose. So Brad has to do a good job to earn your business. And at the end of your evaluation of him and his, your decision-making process, then you can sign on some paper once everything's clear, right? But he's got to put in all that investment and he may get zero still. And, he, and you expect him to walk out of the house with a smile on his face. No problem. Not to yeah. mention the years and years that I've spent studying this too. So that I can communicate it effectively, so that I can structure it properly, so that I can walk a client through the process of taking and repaying a loan responsibly so that they don't ruin the greatest asset that they could ever own. Yeah, and, and ultimately, all, I, I may All this. of that leads to this point, like you're saying yeah. at the kitchen table, where it comes down to, is this guy going to sign on the, is this potential client going to sign on the dotted line and do business with me? 
does he think I'm full of crap and he's going to go back to his financial advisor at TD Ameritrade? Is he going to go down the street to another IBC guy? Because you can do that too if you don't like me. There's plenty of other IBC people out there that you might vibe with. All of that risk, there has to be some reward at the end of it for me to incentivize me to provide this service. I'm just providing yeah, a service. Yeah. I, I'm just providing my knowledge. Yeah. Of course. Hey, look, we all want business. My, my point is, I think that it's just like the commissions are a good thing. They are a good thing. I, I mean, if, you know, if you're a business owner, you want some, like, it's just, that's what businesses it are. All businesses, right? They're on straight commission. There's no one's paying that business. You're paying them with your money, so right? They have to step up and that's the capitalist system is competition and healthy competition because then they innovate market. and I get to use cool stuff for my money. It Listen, keeps everybody in check. That's awesome. If the insurance companies that I use for my clients could figure out how to hire someone internally, train them in the way that I've been trained to communicate this concept in the way that I communicate it and sell it to clients, sell it to potential clients for a lower amount than what they currently pay me, do you not think that they would want to do that? Oh, there are companies who do. There are companies, they, right? Right. They'll That's sell it through saying. multiple yeah. channels, and if they because if it can go direct to consumer, yep, they cut their costs. They'll have an internal sales team. They'll have an external sales team, right? Right. If the commission structure was not in the best interest of the company, the agent, and the insured then there would be a large overhaul of the industry. I guarantee it because someone would figure that out. It would make that company more profitable. It would make those customers more happy. It would make those employees better paid, et cetera. But yeah. what we have is a result of millions and probably billions of market interactions of willing exchanges between consumers and companies where they've figured out the math basically is what it boils down to. They figured out the math and said, okay, if we pay Brad X amount of dollars in commission for facilitating this transaction between us and a potential client, then we come out ahead, the clients come out ahead, and Brad comes out ahead. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I'd like to continue to see if you can turn me into a customer because I'm getting closer. Uh, right. Really. I just, I want to, I got to see this tax, how it all ends up yeah. tax wise, but so, it makes so, a hell of a lot of sense, dude. So let's go, so let's go back to separating yourself from your capital. How much interest yeah. am I actually losing? Okay. Let me share my screen again. See yeah. if I can get us, see if I can get us there and answer this tax question a little bit. And I'm going to follow you on my own iPad. We'll call it paper. It's a new pa version of paper. Duh. Because if it makes sense, you might get a sale here, buddy. All right, let's go. I'll design that policy in a heartbeat. <laughs> I won't charge you any commission. I'll assign all the commission to you. No problem. All right. So thanks. Thanks. We are going to make, okay. If we purchase this car for $45,000, 6% at a nine, six years at a 9% rate, our financial advisor tells us don't pay $45,000 cash, go borrow that money at 9%. I'm going to earn you 9% in, in your portfolio and you'll come out ahead. Right. Dude, is somebody out there saying not, they'll earn you 9% or, or do you run into, is that what you're telling folks? That you can look at the comment section. I th yeah. I think people were saying, well, I get 8% in my portfolio. I get Oh, 10%. I see. It was, it came from some comments. Okay. No worries. Yeah. I was just wondering. I, I mean, that's what they say too. If, if you ask them what a 401k is going to return over 20 years, they'll throw out the 8% number, 7%, 8%. Yeah. Okay. Why do you, yeah. do you take issue with that number? I don't. I just appreciate the further description or the source or where is it? I, okay. I'm, always, uh, I'm a trust but verify. I need to know where is it coming from? Where, once I do that, once I know that, I might need a reminder, but I'm good. Like you, you got me. I'm closer to a customer. Seven or 8% is just the standard okay. yeah, return on a 401k. All right. All right. So I buy this car. It's you got buy, 9% interest rate buy this as card. far as what they advertise. As far as what they advertise. Correct. But we see that I have made 
$811.15 payments for the first 12 months of the year on this car. So I've paid a total of $9,733.80. Where's that money mm -hmm. going? $5,924 of it is going to actually pay off the car. $3,809.58 is going to the bank, to the people that you borrowed the money from. This is the cost in year one of borrowing money. Even though you have $45,000 sitting in your 401k, you just paid $3,800 to go borrow that money. Why? Mm -hmm. Because hopefully the money in your 401k is bringing in more than $3,800 that year. Okay. All right, hold on a second. Hold on a second. So what is 97, what's 97, 33 or 34 over 45, right? Divided by 45. So that's 21.63% per, essentially, right? No, I'm sorry. Looking at one year. No, you'd have to multiply that. I think you did this earlier. Did you times it by the monthly payment by 72? It's a six year. Not yet. Not yet. I can. 8, 11, 15. Well, that's just going to be our total cost, which is, yeah, times 72. Okay, the 13,000 in change. I got it. 38, 58,000 is our total cost of the car. Total 72 month payments right there. Yeah. Or, okay. I see. Okay. So effectively then you're paying divided by 45,000, you're paying 29%. In other words, if you subtract the difference of 13,000 and change and, and divide that over 45,000 to see where you started over where you started, what percentage of total interest, what percentage of of the balance of that car, price of the car, what percentage of that is interest? And I think your point is un potentially unnecessary interest. Mm -hmm. Okay, you think, so you think 9% whenever you hear 9% APR, right? You think $3,600 like we came up with earlier. That's the smoke and mirrors behind the 9%. 9% is APR. The total volume of interest over the life of this loan is 29.78%. Purchasing this car over six years will cost you 29.8%. So if we divide that by six, on average, that's 5% a year. But we know that's not right because the years are weighted differently. Right. The company wants to get their piece up front faster so that they can then loan right. out your money to, and, and when we say they, they are the banks, right? The people, the richest people in the history. And so then they loan out the money fractionally needing to oodles and oodles of people, which is why if you get down to the bank, it's everybody else at bank there said, Hey, all on the same day, you said, let's go down there and we'll all withdraw our money. You can't. Because it's loaned out multiple times to all kinds of other people, right? Am I getting this right? Right. And then if the bank gets into trouble because too many people want their money back at the same time, let's just say, or maybe some other reasons, now they could, how do they deal with that? They print money? Yeah. I don't know. That's a whole nother. They, yeah. They call it the Federal Reserve and Federal Reserve FDIC bails right. out. Yeah. They get transfers in from other banks. But that they math is they shift the debt, they shift the debt at one time zone. Yeah. This math doesn't feel I feel like I'm still missing something. Is it that easy to say the total interest over where I started? Or do you put it over the fifty eight? In other words, I'm trying to think is twenty nine thirty percent the real effective interest rate on my money? Is that what I'm It is the it is interest by volume. That is the volume of interest you pay. Yeah. So how much is it going to cost you to borrow $45,000? It's going to cost you 29% of $45,000. Okay. That's insane. It's insane, right? Now, but if I make we, the monthly payment though, okay, but I still then assuming, let's say I, let's assume I have 45 here in an emergency fund, which I know most people do not. What are, and so why wouldn't I just plot the 45K down on the car and pay no interest? Because then you never earn interest on the $45,000 again. 
So let's see what the opportunity cost is of that 45,000 at a conservative calculation. It's so we'll, we'll, get, we'll get a compound interest calculator and we'll say $45,000 deposit, no contributions over the same six years. You said 6%? Yes, that would be the right. Compounded 6% a year, compounded annually. Yeah, that's sure. A rough estimate, right? It's not going to be exact because we're talking about daily market changes versus. So the opportunity cost of, of your money at 6% is $18,000 over six years. If it grows at 6%, so instead of, so, all right. So if I, if or, I just. Or what if it's much more than that, Brian? What if you need $45,000 to buy the greatest insurance marketing software in the history of the earth that just came out? What if you need $45,000 to open up a new brick and mortar office? What if you need $45,000 to expand your business in a way that is going to create much more than $19,000 in interest? right? The opportunities are endless as to what we could do with that $45,000. We're being super conservative saying 6%. You know, yeah. I have clients that do real estate that don't even look at a deal unless it's 18% on paper, right? Yeah. I like to be real conservative, real, because it's, it's like super, all butter. Super from conservative. You give, okay. you give someone that's savvy with a buy and hold real estate, $45,000, and they'll go out and buy a 10 door apartment complex. You know what I okay, mean? But let's talk. And I love those people. I want to be more savvy like that. So just 401k versus is this okay? Let, so can you show, is there a, or a calculate? Okay. So we put in not per month to 401 company matches X growth is X. Here's what it could be. It could You'd find calculators that do that. Yeah. But my point is even all, all the growth inside of the 401k over those years are subject to market timing. So what if you were to retire in 2006 and then the market crashed in 2008, right at the beginning of your retirement, then you're back at work in 2009, right? So market timing has a lot to do with that. Number two is the, the loss in interest payments to third party and separating yourself from your capital. Okay. Let's say, okay, 401ks are back on the table, right? Because honestly, I don't care what my clients do with their money after they put it in the policy first. Just as long as the money goes in the policy first, they're going to start that uninterrupted compound interest earnings on that money, and then they can go use it for whatever. If they want to buy blue check mutual fund stocks, because that's what Dave Ramsey is telling them to do, they can take a loan from their policy and go buy those blue chip stocks. Right. And uh, okay, on a practical nature, again, how easy is it for me to get the money? Could I link my bank account to it or do I have to make a call? Yeah. Is it a form? Is it an email? Like what's. No, I could open up my client portal right now. Uh, let me go for clients. That's my agent portal. Yeah. So I could open up my policyholder login. I can type in my login information right here. It's already in there. I click login and then literally there's a button that says take a loan. I'm going to take a loan and then it gets wired to my bank account within 48 hours. It's just that easy. And then setting up a loan repayment, I log in and, and I can tell it, Hey, the first of every month draft X amount of dollars out of that exact same checking account. You just sent money to or a different account, mm -hmm. whatever. Interesting. Yep. I could also skip months repayments, right? I've got one loan on my policy that's been outstanding for two years and I've just hmm. been using cash flows to repay it, right? That was just business expense. I, you know, wanted some stuff for my business. It was expensive. I took a loan and went out and bought it. And now I've used the cash flows of my business at $300 a month to repay that. And I didn't come up with $300 a month by accident. I came up with $300 a month because that is repaying myself at a small business loan rate versus my policy rate, right? It's great stuff. Yeah. So it, it is super easy. 
funny. That was, I, that was only one of my three major points, too. We got hung up on volume of interest. We got hung up on opportunity cost and volume of interest. Yeah. Wait. So one point is separation from your capital, right? So what does that do? That creates a reliance on third-party finance. They have these misleading percentage rates. The average American is going to lose 34 and a half cents of every dollar to third-party interest payments, right? So every dollar you make, literally a third of it goes to banks in the form of interest payments. Number two, so you're losing money to interest. Number two, the opportunity costs come not only with the lost interest, but also with the potential of what it could be invested in. So we talked about this a little bit. What if you had $45,000 and all of a sudden you had this great opportunity to expand your business? Or what if this great opportunity came across your plate to buy this rental property that was going to be highly profitable? What if the opportunity came to buy a car wash that's just cash flow? Or what's another good example? Washateria, right? Some of the greatest entrepreneurs in the city own the freaking quarter machines down at the Washateria. You know what I mean? I was going to say hookers and coke, but I remember reading the scripture this morning about the, the, the words that you say and how they matter. That's and right. You're supposed to build people up with it. So I'm like, okay, God, how do I stop this stuff from popping in my head? Like it said, your, words your heart is overflowing. Heart. I'm yeah. like, okay, basically, dude, my heart is an empty pit. What What does that mean? I'm an evil dude. Like, we all are. We all are. We all are evil. Anyway. Yeah. So, so what is, so number one, you're losing money to interest. Number two, you're losing the access to that for opportunities. Opportunity cost, basically. Oh. And Way greater returns than what your 401k might bring about, right? Nelson talks about it in his second book, Warehouse of Wealth. He, early in his banking, banking career, using the infinite banking concept, he had three or four whole life insurance policies that were 20 years old and he had them forever. And then he just realized that he could use them as a bank for capital access. Mm -hmm. And so he starts refinancing some stuff, refinancing a couple business deals that he had, and he gets his finances under control and, and refinance through his policies. And a guy comes to him one day and says, Hey, I've got all of this forest land out in North Georgia. And Nelson was a forester by trade. That's why he went to college. He spent the first couple of years of his career in forestry, growing forests. And so Nelson knows this piece of land that the guy's talking about. They had been friends for a while. The guy was strapped for cash and he was ready to finance this piece of property to Nelson for some cash flows. And so Nelson goes, yeah, sure, I'll buy it from you. So they set up an agreement and Nelson starts buying it month by month like a lease to own type or self-finance, uh, owner finance type deal. Nelson starts growing trees on this thing. It's generating an income for him through forestry. And a couple years go by and the man comes back to Nelson and he says, hey, listen, we've got about 50% left on this deal. If you have the cash right now, I'll sell it all to you for 25% instead of 50%. I'll give you a 50% discount on the remaining balance. And Nelson says, stay right here. Don't move. Runs down to the insurance company, gets them in, in the old days. You used to be able to go to your agent and the agent would write you a check from the company. And then you would go cash the check. So Nelson goes down to his insurance company. He gets the check. He runs back to the guy same day and hands the man a check for the remaining balance on this piece of property that he bought. So 20 years go by. Nelson has cash flowed this piece of property for 20 years through forestry, through cutting down trees and replanting. So it's created a profitable cash flow for him. And now this land that he bought at a 25% discount 20 years ago is worth millions and millions of dollars. And now he's selling this huge cash flowing property in North Georgia that he bought for a song because he had access to capital. And the guy that he bought it from was strapped for cash. So leverage. what is, what would leverage, what would the opportunity cost of Nelson have been had he locked up that money in his 401k, unable to access it versus having it in his insurance policy, 
where a perfect opportunity that aligns with his interest and knowledge comes across his desk that he can capitalize on. That return on investment, that ROI, that difference that you're trying to calculate using software is not accounted for in the software. So those are the extra things that you have to consider what access to capital can create for you. Nelson says, if you have capital, opportunity will hunt you down. These yes, it will. will Everybody. come across your table. If you have money, you can't keep people from calling your phone, telling you about the next best business idea. You know right. what I mean? Or trying to get a load from you, right? Or trying and to get that could be a business, right? And anyway, so start becoming I've a given, bank yourself. I've given a loan to one of my friends so that he could buy a car. He went down to a tote the note lot and was quoted a 26% APR rate. We just tote calculated nine. Imagine, yeah. We, we just calculated 9%. Imagine what 26% would look like on that calculator, right? So I told him, I tell you what, bud, I'll do you a favor. I'll give you a, a loan at 15%. And he was like, 15% really? And I was like, yeah. 15%. And I financed my buddy's Jeep Grand Cherokee at 15% yeah. interest. What a, what a deal for me and what a deal for him. So well, that's number what I'm three. Number, number three. three. So we have separation from your capital, right? Op so you can't get to the money and, and then the opportunity cost that goes with that. Yeah. Uh, separation of capital creates a reliance on third party finance. You lose money to interest at 34 and a half cents on dollar. You miss out on the opportunity costs that you could have capitalized on with access. And number three is the theoretical difference between capital and investing. There's a big difference between capital accumulation and investing. <laughs> Ryan Greens, if you ever watch this video, I apologize in advance. Go watch the full video because this is excellent stuff that Ryan does here in capital theory and, and continuation of Nelson's line of thought, tracing back to Menger's line of thought. Basically, Ryan is making the case that modern financial advice conflates, totally ignores the idea of capital accumulation and capitalization, and, and they confuse it for investing. They totally ignore capital and instead they replace it with investing. Okay. So what do I mean by that? First, you define capital. What is capital? Capital is property value. Okay. The capital value of your home to you is the equity that you have in your home, right? So capital is property value in money terms with an acquisitive purpose, with purpose of acquisition. Okay. So capital in, uh, in your home could be leveraged, right? The equity in your home could be leveraged to go purchase another property that would involve getting a second mortgage, but you could go purchase a second property using the capital that you have stored in your home, right? How do you accumulate capital in your home? You make monthly payments towards the note that you have on your home until you finally own it. And then that concrete asset, your home, has a property value in terms of dollars, right? An insurance policy is no different. An insurance contract is actually a piece of property in the sense that it is a claim, okay? Just like you would say that if we were gold miners back in 1749 and we were going mm -hmm. west to California, if we had a title for a piece of property that gave us the right to mine gold on that land, that title, that contract, that claim to that land is just as good as the land, right? In terms of ownership, right? I own that land because I have this paper because the previous owner of the land sold it to me, right? The insurance contract is completely analogous to that. The claim that the insurance contract gives you is on the future death benefit. So I'm signing a contract with an insurance company saying, in the future, when I die, you will pay my beneficiaries X amount of dollars. So that contract, that life insurance contract is property that has a definite future value, where as long as I meet my obligations of monthly payments along the way, that company will pay out a larger cash flow to my 
beneficiaries than the money I put into it. So the insurance company, what they do is they calculate the present day value of that future cash flow. Okay, minus all of the premiums they, that they expect to collect. This is all kind of theory, but basically what it comes down to is that life insurance contract is property just like your home is property. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's all we can accumulate. Mm -hmm. We can accumulate and store capital inside of our life insurance contracts by paying monthly premiums, just like we can accumulate and store capital inside of our homes by making monthly mortgage payments. Okay. So where does, what are the implications? Capital is a distinct thing, different than investment. Okay. Capital is the monetary value with acquisitive purpose of an asset. Okay. An investment is taking the monetary value out of that capital good and then deploying it into some unknown investment. So we have to separate capital accumulation or capitalization from investment. And Ryan does that great on this slide right here. So why it matters. Oh, and it goes to an ad, of course. Why does this matter? So Ryan says it's very important for this reason right here, the difference between leverage it and liquidation. So there are two ways to use capital. Okay. To use capital, you can leverage your capital. You can borrow against just like you would go get a second mortgage, just like you would take a loan from your insurance contract. You are borrowing against the value of that item. Whenever you take out a second mortgage, they don't come saw off the backside of your house and take it away. You don't liquidate the backside of your house, right? They just loan against the value you borrow against. Okay. In this situation, you pay interest on the loan, on the leveraged loan. However, you get to enjoy the services of both assets. You get to enjoy the services of the asset you leverage and the asset that you purchased with the leveraged capital. Okay. The potential for growth in this situation is much greater because it's compounding because you don't lose the increase. Okay. The market value of your home doesn't cease increasing whenever you take out a second mortgage. So you can appreciate, you, you can enjoy the appreciation of the value of your home. And if you could use your second mortgage to go buy another home, you can appreciate, you can enjoy the appreciating value of that second home, right? So you don't have to interrupt the compounding growth if you use leverage. And it also gives you control. You have control of both assets now in this situation and control of the cash flows repaying the loans on these two assets. So this is one option you have on how to use capital. Okay. The other option you have is to liquidate the asset or sell it. One option I have to use the capital value of my home is just to sell it outright, pay off the note outright. And then I have a whole bunch of liquid cash sitting there. Okay. Then you don't have the asset. Anyway. Then I don't have the asset. I, I lose can't. the services of the one asset. Where do I live? Exactly. The same thing happens whenever people get into crises and they have a 401k. The 401k has capital value. You can actuate the value of your 401k by liquidating stocks and withdrawing that money out of that investment account. Correct. But what do you do? Mm -hmm. when you, what happens when you do that? You interrupt the growth of that capital value inside of that 401k contract. You also forfeit control of the initial asset in this situation. So one is very unpopular because of this general idea that debt is evil. The idea of leverage is corrupted by this idea that debt is evil whenever it's not. Debt. Well, it's funny because on what we're talking about exactly this, and on one hand, like the interest, the debt, and the loans, and it is evil and it's not evil at the same time, right? It depends on your knowledge, I think, of 
how to use the system that's available to its fullest. That and interest is just the, the cost of future money. It is just the difference between the cost of money now and the cost of money in the future. If I had a treasure chest and it had a, a million dollars in it, and I said, Brian, I guarantee you, you know with certainty, Brian, that this treasure chest has a million dollars into it. I don't know if you have x-ray glasses or what, but you know with certainty that this locked treasure chest has a million dollars in it. And I said, Brian, here's the key to the chest. I will sell you the key and the chest today for a million dollars. Would you it's take like that deal? deal or no, this is deal or no deal. Would you, would you take deal that deal? Deal or no deal island. All right. So what is it? What, what's the would deal you, you're getting? Would you, would you buy a million dollars for a million dollars right now? No, I would do that. Why would you do that? Right. Brian. I have a million dollars in this treasure chest and this key. I'll sell you the chest and the key for half a million dollars. But you don't get the treasure chest and the key for 10 years. Would you do that? You're not messing with me though, right? The money's in there. This is not the money's like in a there. trick. The money's in there. It's... And in 10 years, the money will be in there. And in I the can meantime, confirm that it's in there. Yep. yep. Okay. In the meantime, I get to use the million dollars. But you have my guarantee... That between now and the next 10 years, if you give me half a million dollars today, then I will give you a million dollars 10 years from now. Would you do that deal? No. Still no. Why? Because in the 10 year interim period, you think that you can turn half a million dollars into more than a million dollars, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, what if I said, Brian, if you give me a thousand dollars a month, for the next 10 years, I'll give you this million dollar chest. Would you do it then? So, so what the root, so your money doubles, what every seven years, essentially, if you, uh, so you have 10 years, so 240 plus, I don't know what it doubles. Right. Right, it doubles in seven plus three more. So call it three hundred. I don't know, just rough math. So if I, because that money, yes, but that's over ten years. Yeah, I'm just trying to make a deal that's too good to pass up. Really, I'm, I'm actually just trying to explore it, which is I think what most people are doing, is, or, or what they should be doing. So okay, it, it, looking at it in this way, then I give you essentially, even if I say at the end of ten years I would have had three hundred, let's say. Or even a little more, but you're going to give me a million. How do I use the million then? I just, you're just going to give me the chest. I'm just going to give you the chest. You just get to open it up and use it for whatever you want. I'm I, honestly, I'm, I'm just trying to create a deal in this last scenario. That's too good for you to pass up. So call it 500 bucks a month. You get, you give me five bucks a month for the next 10 years. And I'll give you the million dollar chest. You would take that I, I deal think, all day. I, I think it's a great deal even before you changed it to 500. I, I, it just doesn't, I'm okay. like flat. I'm just blown away. Cause it's wait a second. It doesn't perfect. So I get to keep the bulk of my money. I give you a little bit each month. Yes. It's coming from my cash flow, but I'm already putting it somewhere else anyway, if I'm thinking about doing this. So now, I'm just re it's not like extra cash flow cost. It's just repositioning an income stream from A to B in my, anyway. I'm Exactly. Repositioning a cash flow stream from A to B. Exactly. Okay. That's the point I was driving at. Oh, sorry. No, that is perfect. You got there and, and you said it better than I would have. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is that future money has a cost, right? You had to go through all these little quick mental calculations to figure out, is it worth it for me to take this deal based on the amount of money that I'm going to have to give versus the potential gain that I could enjoy from that money in the meantime? That's what you were working yeah. out in your head. And eventually I got to such an absurd deal that you were like, well, that's a no freaking brainer. I'm going to do that. Right. I'm that's hitting okay. that button. So now what if I said, Brian, in addition to you paying me a thousand dollars a month, every month for 10 years in a row with this million dollar payoff at the end of the road, what if I said that I'll keep a running total of all the money you give me, all the money you give me will be a running total. And you will be able to borrow against that running total 
for the entire 10 years in the form of a loan. So all the money I give you. All the money you give me. So there's a million dollars in the chest that you can't touch. But all mm -hmm. the money that you give me over that 10-year period, I will give you a non-recourse loan with that million-dollar chest as the collateral and a small interest rate that is a capitalized loan interest rate for the entire 10 years. All I'm going to do is charge you interest on the loans. You can access it and pay the interest. You cannot access it and let it sit there. You can do whatever you want. But in the meantime, for that 10-year period, I'm going to count up all the $1,000 payments you make, and every minute along the way, you will be able to leverage and access that $1,000 a month that you gave me in its totality with a small interest charge. Does that sweeten the pot a little more? In its totality. So even if, so what happens if I died? But, all, right, all right, let's do this. Let's say I paid you for a year. I paid 12000 bucks, And then I couldn't use the money, the million for 10 years. Right. right. So question two, and I got to start by, okay, what about after 10 years? I could then use it. What if I don't need it until after 10? What, whatever. Okay. But first part, you got 12K. You're saying that I can access all of it. Don't you need some to fund the policy or vehicle that we're, doesn't some premium go to a death benefit? I know you're making a general point here. But I'm, I'm, I'm using, yeah, I'm just using the chest as a simple analogy. Okay. Yeah, yes. Okay. So in the first year, if you pay me 12,000, then I would give you access to 7,000 in the form of a loan. How about that? How do you get there? What's that? Oh, oh okay. So you're just breaking off a portion for the vehicle. My, for my it's operating like... costs. Yep. Okay. Okay. I had, I had to pay, I had to pay pirates to go get the million dollars to put in the treasure chest. <laughs> I had to pay someone to craft the treasure chest. I had to pay to advertise the treasure chest to attract your interest. I had to pay my salesperson to sit down. Okay. Yeah, I have to pay overhead. I had to pay someone to make the chest. I had to pay pirates to go hunt down the gold, the million dollars worth of gold that went in the chest. I pay advertising. I pay all that stuff. So I'm going to keep some of the first bit of money that you give me. But in the end, there's still a million dollars sitting there. Let's say by year five, let's say by year three, if you paid in $36,000 by year three, correct? then you'll have access to $36,000 in loans. So yes, I will take money initially, but as my treasure chest company turns a profit, I will also give you a portion of that profit and put it towards the money you can take as a loan. Not only will I put it towards the money that you take as a loan, I'll put that money into the treasure chest and actually increase the amount of money in the treasure chest over time. Does that make sense? I'm awake and I speak English. Yes, it makes sense. So I had to throw so, in a movie quote there. All right. Yeah, Ryan just does such a better job than what I can do because he takes an hour in this video. Okay. So all, all I'm trying to illustrate with the treasure, treasure chest example is that future money has a cost. Insurance companies understand this. So what insurance companies do is they look at that cost of that future death benefit that they're going to pay, and then they ask you to pay a little bit of money every month along the way so that in the future, your heirs will have access to that money. It's the treasure chest analogy. I tried to do my best to just make it like a life insurance company. It's basically what a life insurance company does. They have a treasure chest full of money that they promise to you contractually. You make monthly payments. In the meantime, they go towards that death benefit, and then your monthly payments also create a pool of capital or capital value within that asset that you can borrow against. Okay? So yeah. instead of liquidating your life insurance policy, what you do is you leverage your life insurance policy. You never interrupt the growth of your cash value inside of the policy. You keep it compounding. You never have to sell off your life insurance policy. You maintain it for the life of the policy so that your beneficiaries can get that million dollar treasure chest at the end. You never forfeit control of the policy. You can access the capital inside of the policy by borrowing against the capital value and then use that 
actuated capital, use that cash to go do anything you want with. You can invest in a 401k if you want. So what is worst case scenario? Like if, every, if everything, I, I don't, let me try to narrow that question down. Obviously, you might not get approved based on health is one thing, but let's assume you're approved. This is a plan like anything else. You have to project into the future as best you can and make the best decision you can with the uh, information available and so forth. All that being said, what if I die before the 10 years? Then my beneficiaries get the death benefit. Million dollars. What if I still owe? Oh, oh, I'm, I'm, I just bought that $45,000 car, so I took a loan. Now I die. They get what? A million dollars minus 45000 Okay, so company wins because they get to keep my interest on the loan. I win because in exchange change for that interest, I am with a company that's going to let me participate in some of their earnings, which may completely wipe out or at least, right, the, the interest that I'm being charged. So that's cool, especially if it wipes it out. Great. Even if it cuts it drastically, I'm happy. Okay. And then I get to basically, in a sense, so I doubled my money in a way. I'm not talking growth, but it's Instead of having it at the 401k once, I now have it at the life insurance, it, but then I load out some, so I'm using right. it twice and this is still right. Great. Two uses out of every dollar. That's a great point. That's a big yeah. line that you'll hear in the infinite banking spaces. You get two uses out of every dollar and what you just walk through illustrates that. Right. And that's how we call it the infinite banking or it's called that because that's what the banks are doing. They got your money you, once and they're loaning it out oodles and oodles of time, hence the leverage. So you want your own leverage. This is this same concept that the yep. most wealthy are doing on a small scale. Yep. Money is fungible. If I have five $1 bills in my pocket, the person at the grocery store doesn't care which $5 bill I pay for that candy bar with, right? Dollar bill is a dollar bill. It's all the same. Right. That is the actuated capital that I've accessed in my asset or I've liquidated something to get that, that $5 in my pocket. So whenever you use a loan from your policy, you get a dollar bill and then you go buy something with that dollar bill. And then you are going to repay that dollar bill back in your policy. And that dollar bill is sitting there waiting for you to use again. You can consider that the exact same dollar bill that you took out because it's fungible, right? A dollar is a dollar. So you literally get an infinite amount of uses out of every $1 that you put into mm. your policy. Does that make sense? Sort of, but it, tell me in a different way. Unlimited, okay. I was with you on, okay, where's the unlimited uses? In other words, because okay. I could just keep loaning out the same money and, and, and buying other things, mm. or I could take the, let's say I got a hundred K in, in, in this policy, then I could take some and use it here, pay it back, use it again. Is that what you mean? Basically just like. Yep. Rinse and repeat. Yep. Yeah. So I loan you a dollar and I say, Brian, in one week, I want this dollar back. I actually, I want to, whatever. We, we, I won't even charge you interest. Brian, in one week, I want this dollar back. And you go out and you buy a candy bar. And that dollar, that physical dollar that I gave you is gone forever, right? You'll probably never see it again, most likely, right? But you're going to make another dollar and you're going to hand me that new dollar, right? And I'm going to get that dollar and I'm going to put it in my life insurance policy. And then to me, that might as well be the same dollar that I gave you. It doesn't matter if it's the exact same dollar or if it's a dollar from somewhere else. I got my dollar back and I put that in my life insurance policy. And then you come to me a week later and you're like, Brad, I need to borrow another dollar. So I give you another dollar and then you give me a dollar back and then I give you another dollar and I give you the dollar back. If I do that 10 times, I'm only using $1 personally. I just paid $1 into my life insurance policy and now I can loan out that $1 50 times to you over the course of 50 weeks if I want to. As long as it's coming back to me at the end of the week, I don't care, right? Now to make that profitable and worth my time, I'm going to charge you a little bit of interest. But essentially, I take $1 and I put it in my life insurance policy 
And then I have an infinite amount of uses for that dollar. It just keeps coming back to me, keep going right in my insurance policy. So it has an infinite amount of uses and it creates an infinite amount of uses for a single dollar. And that dollar is the same I because I back though, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I, I'm charging you interest too. So for well, my, okay. But if I'm taking out my dollar and I pay it back to myself after paying interest to you, I still have to pay back the dollar. Oh, but you're the borrower. You're not the banker. Mm -hmm. I, I'm the banker. In this no, situation. I know, I know, I know. So I'm just thinking about if I am the, if I'm borrowing that money, then I pay back the loan. So I, I let's say I'm putting in my thousand dollars a month. You fund my bank. Then I take a loan that I want to pay back. Am I adding? In other words, do I need to take more cash flow to cover the loan plus my thousand then? Yes. Which then could increase my monthly expenditures. Yes. If I want to reuse the money again, right? Correct. Correct. Yep. But either way, it's still getting the the whole amount is still getting it in growth. Correct. Okay. Correct. That dollar, even though I loan it out to you fifty times, is still earning uninterrupted compounding interest as capital value in the policy. Because I've leveraged, I have not liquidated. Now, if that dollar were in a 401k and I were to liquidate that to loan it to you out of a 401k, then I would not earn interest on that dollar at the same right. time that it's loaned out to you. If it's in right, my policy, yeah, then I earn it's interest missing. and dividends inside of the policy because I'm leveraging. So Ryan asked the question here, I think perfectly. If capital is a pool of financial value, to be used to acquire other stuff, and it is, why would you ever want to liquidate the asset and terminate the growth of that asset? Why would, if you had a penny that doubled every day for 30 days, why would you ever cash out the account in the middle of that 30 day run? Why not just wait for 30 days? What if I need the money or something else? Emergency. Then hopefully that money is stored in an asset and a capital asset that you can leverage against instead of liquidate. That's yeah, why I, pro I probably wouldn't need to take loans if I had enough cash of my own, regardless, or access to money, I should say, to buy things. Then I wouldn't need to run a credit card debt, which was, you know, if you, have, if you have access, if you have access to your own money and you're paying cash, then you're losing out on the interest that you could have earned on that cash inside of the policy. I'm, I'm going to you, see if I can find or put together like a spreadsheet or something that factors in all of this to a calculator for lack of better, but, but just to, because that's how I have to decide things. It might be helpful to someone else too, but it's like, okay. What if I do this? What if I do that? What if I do that? I want to see. That's how I do my taxes for business, right? Especially come to the mid to the end of the year. I'm like, all right, how am I tracking? Do I need to pay in more? Do I need to, can I buy more stuff that helps my business grow that then reduces yep. tax? I got to do all that and say, so one machine. I'll tell you that if you compare the internal rate of return in an insurance policy to the internal rate of return of a 401k, the on paper, the 401k will win every single time. Which and is that, why I need a comprehensive, because there's too many things beside the IRR exactly. the policy. Yeah. That is the fatal flaw of most financial advisors. They discount at, using third party finance and losing interest to third parties. They discount the opportunity cost of what access to capital gives you. And they discount, uh, well, and, and then the power of leverage allows you to make those first two things possible within the infinite banking concept. I guess the, for, uh, the easiest thing for a, someone to do is say, okay, if you have a credit card balance or whatever, what's the percentage rate on that credit card and what's the balance? Multiply it out, divide it by 12, and that's how much you're paying every month in just interest. To, to the privilege of allowing the bank to give you usage of their money 
dang, I have to point. It's, I, I call that old timers. Some, some timers, maybe. Uh, shoot, what was my point, so, dude? The model, the spreadsheet is not going, it's, it's going to be really tough to account for that paying that premium on that money that you're borrowing, paying that interest rate on that money that you're borrowing. Because there's all kinds of factors that go into it, Brian. Like the, the average, I just looked up the study. Where did it go on my screen? I exited it out. Okay. Average length of home ownership in America. The average U.S. homeowner stays in their home for 12 years. So they don't even finish off paying off their mortgage. Okay. Let's look at the amateurization calculator. I don't want to pay off my mortgage. Of a $450,000 home. Where's my amateurization calculator? Of a $450,000 home over 30 years financed at 9%. Look at this. In the first year, this person will make $43,000 in payments towards their home. Only forty. Uh, only 3,000 of it goes to principal. If the average yeah. American stays in their home for 12 years, let me just do this real fast. Let's see. 12 years. Get a spreadsheet. Go to Google Sheets. And, and we'll sum that. And we'll sum that. And we'll sum that. We don't have to sum that. That's the value of the home. Okay. The average homeowner, if they buy a $450,000 home financed at 9% over 30 years, and they live in it for 11.9 years, which is the average length, that homeowner will pay $458,000 in interest over the first 12 years, $63,000 in principal. So this average American homeowner that lives in their home for only 11.9 years could have paid off their house in full if they weren't reliant on third-party finance to buy that home. Instead, they have $63,000 in equity. And this is the point that they sell their house, okay? So now, at this point, what is their volume of interest they've paid? Yeah, what's the difference between you two? Wouldn't it be? Yeah, yeah. So and this so is basically I say four hundred k. Basically, yeah, it's a hundred percent. Yeah, it's a hundred percent. I need hundred percent interest by volume. Like I want to take this offline and throw in, uh, maybe not right now, but like I want to you know throw in my real numbers, my real financial situation. Chat with you about it and go, hey, dude, here's where we're at. Let's see if it makes, see what I need. Because I just feel like I, I could be in a better situation. Like always, I'm always like looking and just, am I missing anything? Is there anything I could tweak or make better? And this is a very interesting concept to me. And then frankly, I'm not, I, until the more we talk, the more of a believer I'm becoming. And I am, I'm a skeptic. Like, I'm off the deep end skeptic. Why? So if you can convince me of something, and I think it's pretty good, at least for my own mindset, it's gold. Me, or I'm a complete me, idiot. I've been there too. For me, and it's just the way m my brain works, for me, it's more of a philosophical convincing than it is an actual numbers on the page convincing. I think if I have a good theory, if I have a good framework, then everything else works itself out. I, I think this is, it, it's like the subjective theory of value versus the objective theory of value. Mm -hmm. How much is something worth? It's well, like it's fine worth, art. It's worth whatever someone's willing to pay, right? Exactly. And we can't put hard terms on value because beauty is in the eye of the beholder. It is Value is subjective, right? A bag full of diamonds does no good to someone start dying of thirst in the desert. 
the bag full of diamonds in a normal setting is way more valuable than a cup of water. But if some guy's dying of thirst no. in the desert, he's trading a bag full of diamonds for a gallon of water. Right. So I guess to sum it up, it's the comments are good. The conversation is good. But when it really gets down to it, it's like everything else. You have to investigate, learn, educate yourself, and so on. And be the contrarian like me and throw things at you until like all the layers are exposed. And then, and I can decide, you can decide this is a good thing for me or not. I, because of me being drawn to like the theoretical framework, I think Ryan's video and heir to Menger is the most convincing video out on the internet. As far as the case for IBC goes. Because he theoretically breaks it down. Why leverage is superior to liquidation. What is capital? Why do we use capital? Who uses capital? What is the smartest use of capital? He goes through all of it. What is the historical definition of capital? How do modern day financial advisors view capital or discount capital? He goes through all of that and he says, theoretically, this is sound. The the theoretically, the numbers will work out in the end because we are working from a sound theoretical foundation. And to me, that's the most important part. It's not necessarily come up with a spreadsheet or a model that accounts for, do I live in a house for 10 and a half years? Do I live in a house for eight and a half years? And what is the yeah. volume of interest yeah. I'm losing over that span? It's if I have a good, strong foundation, as long as I respect the rules of that foundation, then anything I build on top of it will be a, a sound superstructure. Yes. Yeah, build on the rock, not on the sand. That's right. And I think this is the rock. I think dividend paying whole life is the rock of assets. Uh, I think it's it's the most suitable asset to perform this leveraged banking function that I'm talking about. Now, do you just spray one of these across everyone you meet with as soon as you meet them? Just walk in and be, hey, hey, everybody needs this. I mean, banking. No, because yeah, again, he goes. Your car wrapped is with, with infinite banking and everybody should buy one. Yeah. No, everyone mm -hmm. shouldn't. What's the saying? Everyone can do this, but not everyone should do this. Yeah. Who should not do it? Yeah. Who should not do it? People that have a spending problem. If, if you have a spending problem, if you, if your monthly expenditures exceed your monthly income, then you need to go listen to Dave Ramsey and Susie Orman. They are the financial advisors for you. If you have yet to conquer Parkinson's law mm -hmm. of spending more than you make, then Susie Orman telling you to cut up the credit cards and Dave Ramsey teaching you the debt snowball is probably your best bet right now. I will say that paying minimums on a credit card instead of paying them all off and instead Putting that extra money in a life insurance policy first is a smarter way to debt snowball than Dave Ramsey's method. So I think that Dave Ramsey's debt snowball, while good, could be enhanced with the use of infinite banking. I hmm. don't think that that person has the discipline yet to really free up the cash flows he needs to execute that strategy. Yeah, you got to make more than you spend. You got to be disciplined with your finances first. And Nelson talks about in the book. He has a whole section on the human problems. There's five chapters on if you suffer from one of these human problems or if you don't understand one of these five things, then the infinite banking concept is not for you. Hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. I love it. Love it.